Um, sorry, we're starting a bit late. Um, it's, uh, it's no one's fault but mine. It's because I was out on the street blethering. Um, and I don't have Jen with me today to help me keep track of the time. Um, so we'll actually pray for Jen later on in the service. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jen had an accident in the week in which she uh, ended up breaking her leg in um, two parts. She's still in hospital, so we'll pray for her later on uh, in this service. Let me just give a couple notices. Um, I said last week we were hoping to move our Sunday service through to the community centre. As you can see, that has not happened. Um, we, uh, that's not because that's not going to happen at all. It is going to happen. We are going to move our Sunday service through there. We're still in the process of negotiating with the powers that be um, to try and get a, a favourable rate for moving into the community centre. Um, so we will be moving. I don't want to say next week. But we will be moving pretty soon into the community centre for our Sunday services. Um, and that will be good. That will give us a bit more space. You can see it's a bit cramped in here at the moment. Um, and uh, today, because I thought we, were, we would be in this service, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening this morning. It's communion service this morning. Uh, but also after the service, we're going to have food. So um, if you need to go, you can go. But if you would like to stay for lunch, we're going to have lunch in here. Um, and there's a variety of different options. Um, uh, you can stay, even if you don't want to have lunch, you just want to hang out, you can do that too. Um, so what I would say though, is at the end of the service, when we're having our tea and coffee and that, if you're not helping setting up tables, it'd be great if you could just go outside. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> yeah, but just, just hang out on the pavement there. <laughs> just so we can see. <laughs> With Billy, yeah, hang out, <laughs> hang out on the pavement and we can uh, set up in here um, and so it's a lovely sunny day, we are forecast for thunderstorms so we'll wait and see, um, but if it's like it is now then just hang out on the pavement and um, then we'll come back in once we set up the tables. Um, so that, that's what we're going to be doing after the service, it'd be great to, to stick around for that and just eat together. Um, have fellowship together uh, in the early church when they had communion um, it was an act of remembrance for what Jesus had uh, done for them uh, through his death on the cross but it was also a meal that they would have together um, in which they were celebrating the unity that they have through the Holy Spirit and so we want to do that today um, this Wednesday is the prayer meeting that's at seven here in the church so no food at that just prayer seven o'clock this Wednesday and if you need to know what's going on in the church at the back by the couch there is a blackboard which we update every Sunday and um, before the service as to what's happening throughout the week so if you would like to know what's going on this week in the church just if, after the service have a look at the blackboard and that'll keep you up to date on everything that's going on I think that's all the notices I'm going to read some words to us to lead us into a time of worship from the book of Lamentations uh, Lamenta Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22, we'll call the musicians up and then we are going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. So uh, hear these words from God's word from the book of Lamentations. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's stand together and celebrate the faithfulness of our God. Let's sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is 
Okay, um, we're going to pray as we do, as we begin our service, we're going to pray as we do every week for a different nation, um, and usually for a different church that we are connected with as well, and this week we're going to pray for the nation of Egypt, 111 million people in Egypt, about 4% evangelical, um, 13% would say they are Christian, you know, majority Muslim country, but has one of the... Um, oldest uh, body Christian churches in the Middle East. Um, the Coptic, the Egyptian Coptic Church um, is really a key strategy for evangelism in that region. We will pray for the church in the nation of Egypt. Um, Christians still live in a precarious situation regarding religious freedom and persecution. Um, there are many that do not want such a large Christian population. And so we want to pray for a government that will serve God's purposes to restrain evil, punish crime, and enable peaceful and quiet lives among the citizenry. Uh, we'll pray for church leaders. Uh, wisdom and grace and confidence are needed in handling what many face uh, in terms of persecution, um, uh, especially from extremists. And a close walk with God is essential to both a bridge between communities and an example to their flock. Um, and a spiritual awakening church-wide in the midst of mountain pressures and communal tensions. That's what we want to pray for. Many Coptics will be quite nominal. We want to pray for a renewed sense of the love of Christ and a desire to see the gospel go out amongst um, the many people who live in that nation. Uh, since 1973, a renewal movement and a new generation of uh, bold leaders is spurring church growth. Uh, young people are numerous and active in many churches and several Pentecostal and evangelical denominations are seeing notable uh, increase. And so we praise God for the growth of the church in Egypt and we pray that it would continue. Uh, North Africa at one point in history used to be the stronghold of Christianity and we pray that that would indeed happen again. Uh, we normally pray for a different church as well. Um, but this week, what we're going to do is we're going to pray for Edinburgh Theological Seminary, which is the training institution of the Free Church of Scotland, our denomination in Edinburgh, though it trains many people from different denominations as well. Uh, and I think it's important that we pray for that. There are many people coming through that um, who will go on into church leadership. And we want to pray that um, the gospel would be proclaimed in these lectures and that it would raise up laborers for this huge harvest field in our nation to go out and to start new churches and help establish churches witness for Jesus. So we'll pray for that seminary um, and yeah, it's good. I love it. I was trained there. So, so there you go. There's a, there's a glowing recommendation for ETS. Um, so we'll pray for ETS and for the nation of Egypt and we'll pray for ourselves. So let's pray as we begin our service, as we come to worship this great and mighty God. Father, you're love is great beyond all comprehension. Your compassion never once has failed and never will fail. From generation to generation, you have shown mercy to sinners. You have forgiven sin, redeemed people, made them alive with Christ, brought them into your kingdom. Every single morning, your mercy is new. And so, Father, we praise you that that's true because every day we have sin and we need that new mercy every morning. And we need it this morning, Lord. We come as your church and we confess that we're sinners. We confess that we, we haven't lived the way that we ought to live. We haven't loved the way that we ought to love. We confess the, the sinful thoughts and words and deeds of this past week that we have done times where we haven't given any thought or attention to you, where we haven't loved others as we love ourselves, times where we have just done wrong and we want to bring it to your throne of grace. We want to admit to you, Father, we're not hiding anything. You see everything. And so we admit to you that we failed. We admit to you that we are in desperate need of your mercy because we are sinful. And Father, as we confess it, we celebrate too Although our sin breaks us and hurts us, we also celebrate, not in us, but in your faithfulness. The faithfulness to forgive us every day because your mercy is new every morning. 
Father, you are good. You are good to those of us who have put our hope in you. And it is good for us to wait patiently for you, to wait for the salvation of the Lord. And we praise you that we have that salvation through Jesus Christ. And so this morning we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you that Jesus has taken all that sin on himself, suffered for it in our place, and now we are forgiven and adopted and raised to new life with him. Thank you that that's all been done by grace, not because we deserve it or because we've earned it, but because you are good, you are faithful, and your compassions, they fail not. Father, we praise you for that gospel, that gospel that brings about that incredible reversal from death to life. And Lord, we want the nations to hear of this good news. And so this morning, Father, we pray in particular for the nation of Egypt. Father, we pray for your church in that nation. We thank you for the historic witness of the Coptic church. We thank you for the growth in the evangelical church as many Pentecostal and evangelical denominations have seen a noticeable increase since the 70s. Father, we praise you for that growth. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would awaken many in that nation to the goodness of Jesus. Father, we know that for many, it is not an easy place to live as a follower of Jesus. Rising tides of persecution and oppression, Lord, can come from many different areas. And we pray, Lord, that your church would respond with grace and humility, with compassion and kindness, and with boldness to proclaim the truth of Jesus that this nation so desperately needs to hear. Father, raise up a generation of church leaders that will help your church and teach your church faithfully from your word. Father, we thank you for what has happened and we pray that it would continue to grow in that nation. Lord, closer to home, we see in our own nation many people that don't know Jesus. We know that your church is the plan A for the gospel going out to the nations. And so we pray that you would raise up many leaders, Lord, and we thank you for the work that has been done through Edinburgh Theological Seminary. Thank you for the professors there that love Jesus, that want to make him known. And we pray, Lord, for the students, for those studying just now, as they have just finished exams, many graduating. Father, we pray that what they have learned there would be used to build up your kingdom here in this nation and beyond. Father, we pray and ask, would you raise up many more laborers for this harvest field? And would institutions like ETS help serve your kingdom so that people can go out and proclaim this wonderful gospel that we have, that the world needs to hear, that Scotland needs to hear. Father, we pray for ourselves in this scheme here in Charleston. Lord, many of us come with anxiety and worry and hurt and difficulties in our lives. We, we come today with so many things on our minds. And we just pray and ask, Father, not that we would forget that, but that we would see it in the perspective of the eternal salvation of Jesus, that you would help us come out from ourselves and focus on Christ this morning and, and see the wonderful hope that we have in him. And Father, we pray that many more in this community would come to know Jesus and be brought from darkness into light, from hopelessness into hope. Lord, you can do all things. And we know that you can and you will see your gospel go out to the very ends of the earth. And so help us trust you and learn from you. And Father, help us love and care for one another. We pray especially for Jen this morning. We ask that your healing hand would be upon her and you would restore her back to full health soon. And speak to us as your word is opened. May we see Jesus. And may we rejoice that we have such a Savior in His name. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, if you have a Bible, could you open it, please, to uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. I'm missing my page numbers. 650. 650. That, Billy, that doesn't look right to me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, if you've got a Bible with a... Thank you. Page 868, 
if you've got one of the Bibles, unless you've got the mountain Bible that Billy's got, in which case it's page 651. Ezekiel 37, page 868, um, or 651. Uh, continuing our studies, we've been spending the past few months, we've been in the book of Ezekiel, and, and this is probably the most famous chapter in the entire book of Ezekiel. Um, we actually looked at this chapter as a church last year as a one-off, uh, but someone once said this to me, sermons are like food. Uh, with food, you don't always remember what you eat, but you know that you need to eat it to keep going. And when it comes to sermons, you don't always remember what you hear, but you know you need to listen to keep going. So uh, I think that's true. So many of us will probably have forgotten what we looked at last year in Ezekiel 37. Um, and so it's good for us to be back in this wonderful, wonderful chapter. Um, just to give you a bit of context, this is, we're going to read of a vision that the prophet Ezekiel had in a time of real hopelessness. Um, so we're going back 600 years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, God's people, the nation of Israel, um, they were at their lowest point. And they had almost been wiped out as, an, an, as a nation at this point. Uh, they treated God appallingly, and so as an act of judgment, God had raised up an empire called Babylon to take them out. Uh, Babylon invaded Israel, they went to Jerusalem, they uh, sacked the city, and they took off, uh, I think there was about 4,500 people they took off with them back to Babylon as prisoners. And Ezekiel was one of those prisoners who was taken away. And all the people in exile at the time of Ezekiel were hoping that they could get back to Jerusalem. Their hope was kind of built on that city. But God's message to them, God has been speaking to them through Ezekiel, and he said to them, look, don't hope in going back there. It's done for. You've treated me so bad that I am now going to make sure that the Babylonians come back, destroy Jerusalem. I'm going to destroy my temple, and I'm leaving. I'm done with Jerusalem. And so for 24 chapters, that was his message. That's what Ezekiel was telling these exiles. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe that, that, that God would do something like that. And then in chapter 33, verse 21, you get the turning point in the entire book. Ezekiel is told that a man comes to him from Jerusalem who escaped the exile, and he comes up and he just says three words. The city has fallen. It's done. Babylon has come back. They've raised it to the ground. And these exiles, four and a half thousand, you get a bigger attendance at a Hibs game than was left of God's people at this oh, time. <laughs> these exiles were the, all that was left of God's people. And these promises that God had given to them for the world. And so it seems that they've lost all hope. But God's not done with them. And chapters 33 to 48, he, he tells them of this glorious new thing that he is going to be doing in the future through them. This glorious restoration project he has that will affect the entire world. And so we saw a few weeks ago in chapter 34, it began with this promise of sending a king, a shepherd king that would lead his people. Uh, in chapter 35 that we didn't look at, he, he talked about giving them a new land, a place where they will be safe and secure. And in chapter 36 that we saw last week, he, he promised to change his people and give them new hearts. And these are great promises that we've read, promises that were all kept ultimately through Jesus. Now, chapter 37, we get the fourth promise, a promise of a new hope. We could call this episode four, a new hope. Are we, are we Star Wars reference for James? <laughs> That's good, eh? God is about to give Ezekiel a vision of how he's going to bring life and restoration to a people that have lost everything. Let's read it. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me, he led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. 
then you will know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared in them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Amen. This is God's word and we will look at that passage together. Before we do, uh, like I said, the focus really is on the, the hope that God gives today. Before we do, we're going to sing uh, a song. We're going to sing Christ, our hope in life and death. So let's stand together and sing this, and then we'll look at that passage.
have a seat. Uh, and can you get your Bibles open to that passage we looked at, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Um, so get it. Let me just pray again before we look at God's Word. Let me pray. Father God, we just want to pray now as we come to study your Word. This is not a text. It's not a piece of history. It's not just that. It's so much more. It's the living and active and breathing Word of God. And so we pray and ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would cause it to bear on our lives, change our hearts, and would we have the great hope of the gospel that this vision speaks of. Help us see it. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to think about where you're going to go when life gets hard. What are you going to trust in? What are you going to hope in when suffering or difficulty comes your way? Every person needs to have hope. Every person needs to have something that they get out of bed for in the morning, that, they, that helps them when life is uncertain, when they're afraid or when they're going through a hard time. And when you lose that, if you've ever been in that position where you've hoped in something, you've lost it, or you know someone who feels that they don't have any hope, that is a really, really dark place, a really dark place to be. And yet, if we're really honest, often what we put our hope in is not strong enough or lasting enough to sustain us through hard times. So, for example, I think many people just put their hope in their relationships, whether it be um, their partner, whether it be husband and wife, whether it be um, their kids or even friends. And, you know, we need other people, don't we? And they help us get through difficult times. But look, even if you had the best friends imaginable and the most close-knit family you could ever imagine, they are limited in terms of what they can give you. Because our friends and family don't know the future. They, they can't control what will happen to us. Uh, sometimes they can even give bad advice, although it comes from a good place. And they're not enough to satisfy that itch within our souls. You can put all your hope in relationships, but if you do that, you will be bitterly disappointed eventually. People build their hope on getting money, on being well thought of, on making a name for themselves, on doing well in their career. They build their hope on being able to do what they want to do in life. And these are all things that as soon as you get them, you very easily can lose them. I think a lot of people recognize today, I don't think we need to convince people of this, I think a lot of people recognize that the world's a mess. There's stuff going on that's just a mess. And so collectively as a society, we're looking for something to get us through that. What's our hope that we can get out of the mess that we often see in our community, across the global stage? And what a lot of people put their hope in is, well, the, the goodness of humanity. We can move forward together because we are basically good people. That's what a lot of people build their hope, hope in. But I would say to that, you need to read your history if you think that's the case. I remember I read a book when I was younger called Lord of the Flies. You ever read that in, anyone read that in school, Lord of the Flies? Um, you might have seen the film. It's about these school kids. They crash land on a desert island and they basically end up trying to kill each other. And William Golden, the author of Lord of the Flies, he has this really interesting essay, and it's in most of his books, um, but you, you can read it before you read the actual story, where, in which he writes about why he wrote the novel, Lord of the Flies. And he said that when he was growing up and as an adult, he believed in something that was very prominent at the time. This was before the Second World War. He believed in what he called the perfectibility of man. He believed that we could move forward together as a society because we are advancing, we're becoming better, we're evolving, and that we could achieve utopia together. But then he lived through the Second World War. And that changed his entire outlook 
on humanity. In fact, he says this in that essay. He says, There were things done during that period from which I still have to avert my mind lest I should be physically sick. They were done skillfully, coldly, by educated men, doctors, and lawyers, by men with a tradition of civilization behind them, to beings of their own kind. I do not want to elaborate on this. I would like to pass on. But I must say that anyone who moved moved through those years without understanding that man produces evil as a bee produces honey must have been blind or wrong in the head. See, Golden realized, no, we can't look inside ourselves for hope. Why? Because we produce evil like bees produce honey. And if we're completely honest, there's one thing that stands and it wrecks it all. And it's a shadow that looms over everything. And that's death. How can you have any hope when death destroys it all? And we need to get real about that. Not so we despair, but so that we can be drawn to look for a hope that death cannot destroy. And that has to come from God himself. 2,600 years ago, God spoke to a people in a hopeless situation and told them of a hope that death could not destroy. That's the vision that we just read there in Ezekiel. These people had lost everything, but God is saying, no, there is a future for you, a glorious future that death will not destroy. And so I want us to look at this passage today and see that what we see happening here is actually the seeds of a hope that is offered to everyone today. It's a hope you can have in struggle and in hardship, in suffering and even in death. And it is unlike anything else that this world has to offer. The Apostle Peter calls this hope living hope. He says it's unshakable and it's imperishable. And this is the hope that ultimately comes through Jesus Christ. So let's look at this passage here and we'll see what this is. Firstly, though, we need to see, here's my first point, Israel's hopeless situation. Remember, they're in exile, four and a half thousand of them, away in Babylon, they have lost everything. And the one thing that they were holding on to, which God told them not to, was Jerusalem. As long as the city's still standing, that'll be fine. That's now gone. It's gone. And so all that's left of of God's promise for the salvation of the world is this ragtag bunch of people in a shanty town by the rivers of Babylon. They have no city, no temple, no land, no king, absolutely no hope. And then God speaks. And chapters 34 to 48 contain these wonderful promises of this future restoration. But right at the heart of these chapters is this vision in Ezekiel 37. But it's a vision that begins very bleakly. Now, some of you might have grown up in church. You might have heard this story before. And you might have done, even, you might have done it in Sunday school with little felt bones and stuff. This is actually a really horrific picture. Have a look at verse 1. Ezekiel is transported in a vision to a valley of death. So let's try and get into this. Let's try and picture ourselves in Ezekiel's position. He has one of these visions. Remember, um, you may remember when we looked at last time he had a vision was back in chapter uh, 8. And it's like God picks him up and transports him somewhere. I was saying it's like that little man on Google Maps. It's like he just picks him up and then transports him in his mind somewhere. He's transported to this valley of death. What would this look like? This would be absolutely horrific. Picture a great big valley as far as the eyes can see. There are bones everywhere. It's like some enormous grave. It's like like he's standing in the, the middle of the aftermath of a mass genocide. Standing there, walking through it, hearing the crunch of the bones beneath his feet, a skull, a, skull, a, a rib cage, a, a femur littering the valley. It's shocking, and, and God is walking with him through this valley of death. Verse 2, have a look at what it says. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. 
bones everywhere. Dry, what does that mean? It means that they've been dead for a long, long time. So why is Ezekiel here? We actually don't have to speculate because whilst verse 1 to 10 of 37 contain the vision, chapter, uh, sorry, verse 11 to 14 contain the explanation of what this is all meant to mean. So have a look down at verse 11. This is what these bones represent. Then God said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. This is a picture of the very people that Ezekiel is preaching to. The exiles in Babylon. They're dead. Not literally, of course not. They're listening to Ezekiel. They've survived the exile. What does the dry bones convey about them? Well, it conveys the fact that they feel, I guess, as if they might as well be dead. They have no hope. They have nothing. Utterly spent. Just a pile of dead bones. In relation to God, it's as if they're dead. I mean, look at that cry in verse 11 that we just read. You know, our, our, our hope is gone. You can feel the pain of that. Like I said, said at the start, to have no hope is one of the darkest places you can be in your life when you feel I've got nothing. I'm just floating about in darkness with nothing. You're dead. And the dead bones not only convey how bad it is, but they convey how powerless you are to do something about it. You cannot reverse death. Now, we are not in the same situation as the exiles of Ezekiel's time today. But here's the thing. If you read through the Bible, you would see that actually this is quite a common picture for humanity as a whole. Humanity without God. This is all of us. Dead. Not physically, but, but spiritually. Without Jesus, this is what we are like. Dead towards our maker. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesian Christians... That before they followed Jesus, it's as if they were dead in their trespasses and sins. These dead bones, yes, this is Israel, but this is humanity without God. Cut off, no hope, spiritually dead, and subject to physical death. What can we do? Answer, nothing absolutely nothing. We can try and build up these little sandcastles of hope in this life, but the tides of time will wash them away. We can do nothing. No amount of being a good person or trying to be religious or trying to be nice will reverse death. We are cut off and our situation before God Almighty is as hopeless as dead bones littering a valley. But mercifully, the God of Israel the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is big into the business of resurrection. And this is where the hope comes. And so here's the second point then, God's hope-filled solution. I'm going to draw out four notes of certain hope that we can see in what God does here. Let's keep looking with Ezekiel. Let's keep looking through his eyes. Stand with him a bit longer in this valley. Ezekiel is there surrounded by the bones and he hears God speak to him and say in verse 4, prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel's call now is to preach to the dead bones. This is a tough gig, right? Sometimes when I stand up the front and speak, maybe not here, but in other places that I get invited to speak to, I can see folk dozing. You think that I can't, but I can. We notice, well, Ezekiel's audience, they're all dead, literally. They've been dead for a very, very long time. And then something amazing happens. These bones start to move. He's there, he's preaching, and the bones start to shake. Hundreds of thousands of bones start to rattle. You ever heard that noise? I hope not. That would be weird if you had. But apparently it's a deafening noise. In Hebrew, the word for rattling there in verse 7 is not like a little baby's rattle. like ch -ch -ch. It's the same word that's used for earthquake. 
As these bones shake, the earth is moving. It's this earth splitting sound. And they start to rumble and they start to shake and they start to fly together and they start to form what appears to be a skeleton. And then as the skeleton forms, the sinews start to appear. Then the flesh, then the skin. I mean, this is just incredible vision. Who knows how long this happened, how long he was standing there for. But it would have looked amazing. I said this last time I preached on this passage, but uh, in my head, the way I picture this is like the scene at the end of um, that, the Indiana Jones film where that Nazi guy looks at the Ark of the Covenant and his face melts off and it's just a skeleton. It's like that, but in reverse. It's just coming together. And before long, Ezekiel is surrounded by a vast army of people. But they're not alive. They need breath. So verse 9, Ezekiel is called to prophesy to the breath. Now, well, let's learn some Hebrew. So we can take away some Hebrew today. The Hebrew word for breath is the word ruach. Ruach. Which is also the exact same word for spirit. So what do these people need to live? They need God's ruach. They need God's breath. They need God's spirit to bring them to life. And notice how the spirit comes and brings life through the proclamation of the word. Ezekiel has to keep preaching, keep preaching, keep prophesying, and the Spirit of God comes and gives them life. You know, for the original hearers, and you may know this if you've, if you've ever read the Bible before, this would have conjured up in their minds images from Genesis chapter 2. Way back in the beginning of the Bible, when God first created Adam, what did he do? He formed him from the dust, and then he breathed life into him. And so what is God saying he's going to do with these exiles? He's going to renew them. He's going to restore them. It's as if he's going to remake them like a new humanity. And so here we see the first wonderful promise of hope in this vision. It's the hope of being made new. The hope of a people renewed by the Spirit of God. God is going to restore Israel, by his Holy Spirit. And we can think, well, you know, this is a vision. So it's obviously symbolic. That's what visions are. They're kind of like symbolic pictures of reality. And so this is a symbolic reference to the fact that God's going to bring them out of the, the death of the exile and back to their own land to live. And yes, that's exactly what he did. But it's bigger than that. And the exiles knew that. We saw this last week. God's not just wanting to relocate his people. He's wanting to change their hearts. To change their hearts from stone to flesh. It's as if they were dead to God, but now they're going to be made alive to God. He's not just promising relocation. He's promising transformation. From the inside out, he's going to get rid of their sin and its consequences. That's what we saw last week. He's going to cleanse them and he's going to make them new. And that promise was kept. 600 years after this vision, when Jesus Christ came to wipe away all sin and wrongdoing, to suffer for it in our place, that is what he did on the cross. And he dies for our sin, not just so that we can be forgiven, but so that we can be renewed, united to him. That's why in that letter to the Ephesians, uh, after Paul has reminded the church that they were once dead in their sins and transgressions, he goes on to say this in Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We are all in a hopeless situation, dead in sin, But Jesus came to make us alive. You see, if you believe Jesus, not only are your sins forgiven today, here's the great promise. You get God's Ruach. His Holy Spirit comes into your life. 
And he begins a process of changing you from the inside out. And you're united now to Jesus. You're alive with him. And so you start to hate sin and long for him. It's a change. It's a renewal. It takes time. And for all of us here who do follow him, how did that happen? It happened when we heard the word of God and God opened our eyes to the truth. Just like Ezekiel saw. Maybe that will hit home for some people for the first time. But the implications of this are wonderful. If you are alive with Jesus, you're no longer under judgment. You're not a dead bone. You have the eternal hope of salvation. And you cannot lose that hope because it's bound with the one who lives. How can I know that's happened to me? How, okay, well, how do I know that God's Spirit's transformed my life? Well, in Ezekiel, there's one big defining trait for those who have been made alive. See if you can see it. It's all throughout the book. Verse 6, verse 13, verse 14. What's going to happen to these people? Then, go on. Get the Spirit. And the repeated words that's used for those that have the Spirit. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's how you know you've been made alive by God's Spirit. You know God. Not just intellectually, but personally, intimately, affectionately. You really know what it means to call him both King and Father. You know his grace. You know his mercy. You love him because you know him. He is yours and you are his Notice how in verse 12 and 13, he recalls these renewed people, mine, my people. Previously you were dead. Couldn't give two hoots about God. Now you're united to Jesus. You love him. You belong to him. And so in Christ, we have the hope of an eternal salvation that we will not lose. But this vision also has a second note of hope about it. And it's easy to miss, but it's incredible. It's the hope of a great multitude. Look at verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet. A vast army. It's vast. It's vast. Now that is significant. Remember, how many we got here? Just a handful of people in exile. But what God is going to do through them will create a vast army of people. Why is that significant? Well, hundreds of years earlier, God had given a promise to Israel through a man called Abraham. And in this promise, he told Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Now, all the promises of God at this time seemed like they were going to fall flat. But in these chapters of Ezekiel, God is showing us, no, no, I've not forgotten my promise. Israel, you've been faithless to me, but I am faithful to my promise. I've not forgotten that. There will come from you a vast and great multitude of people, renewed by the Spirit. And Ezekiel sees this vast army, renewed by God's Spirit, through God's Word. And again, whilst Israel did return to their land and increase, the fulfillment of this happened much later when the apostles of Jesus went out to the world world with the Word of God and the power of God's Spirit. And what you see is that what began in Israel started to spread to the entire world. Which is why we're talking about it today in a housing scheme in Dundee. You see, when we go out and we share God's word, the truth is that we do not do it alone. God's spirit is still working, bringing life. And there will be a great multitude who will respond. That's why, by the way, you can have hope in mission. Just think how you became a Christian. It wasn't because you worked it out. It wasn't because that's how I was brought up. You were dead. You were dead. And Jesus made you alive. You did nothing. He did everything. You heard the word. He changed you by his spirit. So folks, here's what I think we really must get in our minds. And I was thinking a lot about this. 
We desperately want the people in Charleston to know the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist as a church. We want them to know because without this good news, there is no hope. And yet it's difficult to tell people about Jesus because the, the different reactions you'll get, like people might think you're a crackpot or they might get hostile or it might just be embarrassing, whatever. But here's what we must get in our minds. We must not think that evangelism, telling people about Jesus, we must stop thinking that it's hard. Here's the truth. It's not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible. We need to start thinking like that. Because if we think, oh, it's just hard, then what we'll do is we'll come up with strategies to make it less hard. And so we'll start making it all about us and what we do and how we speak and what kind of questions we address and all that. And, you know, that's good. But if that's our focus, then the focus becomes on us. No, we need to see this is not hard. This is impossible. Exactly. And if we recognize it's impossible then we are freed from trusting in ourselves and our abilities. Because no matter how good we are, we can't do it. Here's what evangelism's like. It's like going to a graveyard and shouting at the graves, come back to life. That's what mission's like in the Bible. Absolutely impossible for us, but not for God. Can God save the people in this scheme? Can the thousands out there who don't care about Jesus come to know him? Can my workmates or family who take the rip out of me for following Jesus come to know him and follow him? Or let me rephrase the question like this. Can these bones live? That's the question. And I love Ezekiel's response. Humanly speaking, no. But Ezekiel doesn't say that. He just leans on God's sovereignty and says, Oh Lord, you know. God knows. He can, he has done, and he will bring life. We just need to go out with his word and let his word do his work. By his spirit. Who knows what he'll do? Don't tell God the bones can't live. No matter who your colleagues are, who your family are, don't say to God, no, no, that person can't live. You can't be more dead. There's not someone who's more dead than someone else. You're dead, you're dead. God can bring life into anyone. You, O Lord, know. And we do know this because he has said it. In the end, there will be a vast army of people around the throne of Jesus. So great, you won't be able to even count them. Here's the third promise of hope that we have linked into that, the hope of resurrection. You see, this vision is the assurance for the exiles. You are going home. You're going back to the land. Look at verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the sovereign Lord. That is what happened. But again, that's going beyond that. You know, when the exiles went back to the land, they didn't just get rid of Ezekiel. Oh no, they would have studied these promises. They knew something more was to come. What does God say here? He says, I will open up your graves. Notice that we're not in the valley anymore. We're in the graveyard now. We've moved from the valley to the cemetery. And God is saying he is going to open up their graves so that they can go home. I don't think we can read this in light of the resurrection of Jesus and miss the bigger implication. The hour is coming, says Jesus in John chapter 5. The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man and those who hear will live. Death is not the end. The Apostle Paul said, look, if we only had hope for this life, then we would be pitied more than anyone else because we have believed a lie. 
But we don't. We have hope for now and hope for beyond the grave. Jesus has died for our sin so that we could be with him forever in a new land, in a new creation that is free from sin and suffering and tears and death. That is the eternal, unshakable hope of the gospel. It's a hope that's caused hundreds of thousands of Christians throughout the ages to be willing to hold on to their faith at the great cost of their own lives because they knew their king had risen. Death does not have the final word for us. Jesus has removed its sting. He has flipped it on its head. He has taken that curse against mankind and he has used it as our gateway to paradise. In some ways, we are like the exiles in Ezekiel's time. The apostle Peter says that in his letter. We're like exiles. This world is not our home. Our final destination, the world we are made for, is one when we are with Jesus, when he will open the grave, call our name, and take us home. And that is absolutely guaranteed to happen. Why? Because he's done it. But here's the fourth note of hope, because he says he's going to do it. The hope of God's certain word. End of verse 14, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Why is this guaranteed? Because God says so, that's why. And God always does what he says. How this must have been a comfort to these exiles. You see, remember, God had said to them through Ezekiel, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. They didn't believe it, but it happened. Because he always does what he says. And as they look back on the certainty of the judgment that came with God's word, now they can look forward to the certainty of the hope that comes with God's word. He has said he's going to renew them. He's going to make them into a vast army. He's going to take them home. It will happen. Why? Because he said it. Folks, we have the hope of new life now. We have the hope of life with Jesus forever. We have the hope that this gospel will go out to the ends of the earth and nothing will stop it. And it's so certain, so unmovable, so guaranteed because it's not rooted in us and our faithfulness. It's rooted in him and his faithfulness. Nothing can kill this. It's a hope that undoes death. A hope achieved through death. How can you kill that? There was a famous missionary called D.L. Moody, and he once said this. Someday you will read in the newspaper that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. This is what our God does. He takes the impossible and he reverses it. He takes the sinners and he makes them saints. He takes the stone and he makes it flesh. He takes the dead and he makes them alive. And it's a guarantee because he said it. And as we've seen, he always does what he says. I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it. That's the hope we have in a world of fear and uncertainty. Let me pray. Father, thank you for that wonderful vision that gives hope in hopeless times. And Father, pray that as we study it, we would realize the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The hope that right now we've been made new by your spirit. The hope that if we just come to Jesus, he will get rid of all our wrongdoing, all our sin, and make us alive. The hope that this great news will go out to all people and change the lives, not just of us, but of many, many others. The hope that Death will not be the end, but we will be raised to new life. And that hope is grounded, certain, it's guaranteed, because you have said you will do it, and you always do what you said. And Jesus Christ has led the way. He's already done it. He's already defeated death. And so we thank you. We have a living hope, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, any questions before we uh, move on to sing? Any questions on that? Questions, thoughts, words of wisdom?
No. No. Good. Hopefully it was clear. Let's sing. And then we're going to, um, after we sing, grab your seat and we're going to have the Lord's Supper. So let's stand together and we're going to sing the song, uh, Living Hope.
please do uh, have a seat. Have a seat. Um, we're going to have communion now, or the Lord's Supper, as it's sometimes known. Um, we are going to eat some bread and drink some wine as an act of remembrance for what Jesus Christ did for us through his death on the cross. The bread represents his broken body, the wine, his shed blood. Uh, here is what this is not. This is not some ritual. It's not magical. This bread and this wine will not get transformed into the uh, blood and body of Christ. And eating and drinking this will not save you. This is not a lucky charm. Here is what this is. The bread and the wine are given as signs that help us remember that what Jesus has done for us by his death on the cross. When we take it, we remember and we are proclaiming together as his church that Christ has died for us. He has borne the wrath that our sins deserve. And so it's there to remind us of that, but it's more than just a reminder. As we do this, we are conscious that we are united to one another, yes, but ultimately to Jesus. And so this is an assurance of Christ's presence with us. We were once dead, but now we are alive in him. I need to say this is not for everyone to take. We may have people, we often have people who come here and visit, people who are exploring Christianity, and they wouldn't say they were Christians, may be interested. Um, please, if you're not a committed follower of Jesus, uh, if you've not repented of your sin and given your life to him, please do not take this bread and wine. Um, rather, use this time to come to him, to come and ask for mercy, and let this be the last time that the cup passes you by. But if you are someone who has genuinely repented, and you're striving to live faithfully for Jesus, church, Jesus and for his church, please do take this. This is not for people who have their lives sorted. It's for people who know that they don't have it sorted and they need a savior. If you feel a sense of unworthiness, then that is a very good thing to feel at communion because you're not worthy and neither am I. But take this bread and this wine and use this time to prayerfully reflect on the fact that all God's anger for your wrong has gone on Jesus so that it would never have to go on you. He has paid the price to save you. Use this time to reflect on the fact that you now have access to God as a child has access to a father. We were once sinners who were dead, but now we have been made alive, forgiven and adopted and invited to his table. Uh, now, myself and Tim will hand out the bread and the wine. If you are taking the bread and the wine, which is uh, non-alcoholic wine and gluten-free bread, just so you know, um, just take it as you receive it. You don't need to hold on to it. And then Rachel will play as we do that. Um, but let me read these words from 1 Corinthians 11, and then I'll hand it out. Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Let me, uh, let me pray. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so we praise you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed so that we could be forgiven, adopted, invited to your table. Father, we thank you that you gave up your one and only Son to rescue us from a judgment that we deserve. We thank you that you have done it by grace, not because we have earned it. We thank you that not only are we forgiven, but we're alive. We have your Holy Spirit in us, uniting us to you and uniting us to one another. We thank you for the bonds of fellowship and love that come through the Spirit of Christ. We are conscious, Jesus, of your presence amongst us. And we praise you, our Savior, for all that you have done. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise as we proclaim your death. In your, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to finish. The Lord Jesus um, tells us that we are to proclaim his death until he comes back. That's what we do at communion. And Jesus is coming back, coming back to restore this world and to end all evil and suffering once and for all. And so we're going to do as we usually do every communion. We're going to close by singing words from Psalm 24. Um, this was a psalm that the Israelites sang as the Ark of the Covenant came to Jerusalem. They sang it as a celebration of the fact that God in all his glory had come to be with them. And we sing it today looking ahead to when King Jesus will return in glory to be with us. These bones will rise and we will live because our King has the victory. So let's stand together and we'll sing Psalm 24. And please remain standing, if you're able, for the closing prayer.
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. 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 Please do have a seat. If you would like some tea and coffee, it will be served. And if you would like to have your tea and coffee outside where it's slightly cooler, that would be good too.